Hey, it's Deborah Atkinson, host of Flipping 50 TV. I'm the Flipping 50 podcast and the best-selling author of You Still Got It, Girl, and Hot Not Bothered. And I'm here with number two, the energy and weight loss block, number two, that's most common for most women in midlife because of the conditioning that we've had for decades and the things we've come to believe. Even when, here's the stinker, even when we have proof, science, that what we're doing isn't working for us, we still tend to default to it if it's something that we learned at a time when we were really impressionable. And, you know, that's important to realize. Give yourself a little break. If you keep repeating the same mistakes, keep getting the same results, realize that it takes a little while to go through it, repeat it, trust it, and you're looking for, how can I do that in a short period of time, commit to at least this, and then start feeling the results so that I can make more progress. So those little challenges and nudges can be very helpful. But the second roadblock is this, it's that you're eating healthy foods defined decades ago. Two things wrong with that, number one, all science has changed, right? I mean, you would agree that you're not going to default if you wanted to go find the most up-to-date information on any topic in the world. You would not be looking at a study that was from 1987, but many of us are eating and exercising the same way we learned it back in 1987. So I don't know where you are, right? But in 1987, I was entering grad school and you know I was learning many of the things that are incorrect right now we were reinforcing that exercise more and eat less and we were totally into low fat no fat non-fat whatever <laughs> I think snack wells was having its heyday back then do y'all remember that so, you know, if the box of cookies has no sugar in it, well, I don't just have to have a serving size. I can have half the box, right? That was it. And if I, you know, can have Diet Coke, Diet Cherry Coke. Does anybody remember that? I don't even know if you can still get that. Don't drink it. But I would start my day with that. I would start my day with it, go and teach a 6 a.m. class, and come back and probably have another one. Oh my gosh. So you get the idea. We're not going to go back to research. This is 1987. You and I, at least I, I'm looking for research that's within the last five years. And I'm looking every week. I sit down and have blocks of time when I'm looking at what's the research based on 2020? What's happening right now? What's even pre-releasing? So it's not out yet, but I can share it based on what's the thread that it's going off of in these last few years. That's the most up-to-date and current because it's being based on everything we used to do, we used to know, we're building on that, we're getting smarter. So you've got to be careful about what you eat the same way we do about how we exercise and what we're telling others to do with exercise, meaning me. So if what worked, and what was healthy for all of us. Now was true, you know, we wouldn't have so many diets that work for different people. Some people will thrive on paleo or keto, at least for a while. Some people will thrive on a vegetarian diet or on um, a Mediterranean diet, at least for a while. And sometimes we all need to rotate what we're doing and do a little detox and do a little change because our bodies need that diversity. But most of us will settle into a, this is how I feel the best. And what you're doing probably is confirming your DNA. So I will test DNA and genetics with clients who really wanna know right away, give me the shortcut to better results so I know the optimal way to exercise. I personally respond better to endurance exercise. Now, trust me, that doesn't mean that I don't strength train because we know that at the age 40 and 50 and 60, we've had decades of muscle loss that happens if you age without resistance training. So I'm doing more strength training 
in proportion to the number or minutes or workouts that I do cardiovascular training for sure. However, if I want to dial up my own fitness level easier, effortlessly, I'll do more endurance training. So I have, during COVID, gone for more long walks, not even getting breathless, that's not the point, but 45 minutes or hour long walks, so I'll do about four miles a day. Sometimes that's two and two, sometimes that's three miles in the morning and one in the night, and it's not fast. But the point is, some of you, may respond better to anaerobic work, meaning you love strength training, you hate endurance work, you hate anything to do with getting breathless in any way, but you may respond better to strength training, interval training than you do to somebody telling you go for an hour walk or go for uh, an hour run. And really right now, that's a bad idea just during COVID-19, just saying, there's a point where we start tipping our cortisol instead of it coming down, decreasing our stress after exercise. If you're exercising long enough, instead of coming down after exercise as it should, you're ramping it up and you're making it worse. So be careful with that, all right? Coming back to food, let's talk about foods. If you're still thinking it's you should be having dairy every day or dairy is the way for bone density, you know, I would be careful with that information. We, we know we need some calcium. We know we need vitamin D, we need magnesium. You need your body to absorb it, but you don't necessarily need it from dairy cows. And that's an inflammatory food for the majority of us. So there are ways to test it. Yes, you can go to a lab, but your body never lies. So when you remove it and then challenge your body against it, one of the best ways to get personal feedback that you will trust and live by. Because if you feel bad, you feel bad and we want to avoid that. That's easy. So other things beside dairy are wheat and gluten. And I separate the two even though wheat is both, right? Wheat is wheat and wheat is gluten. But there are other foods that are gluten and if you're eating a lot of go to your refrigerator and open it up. Are there commercial salad dressings in there? Chances are there's gluten in there because that's used as a thickening agent. It's also used in canned soups. So you have to be careful and look for things that say gluten-free, but you also don't want to just go down the gluten-free aisle because that's stuff that marketers and producers have created because they know we're looking for it. And a lot of those are just made with fillers that are unhealthy and almost worse than the gluten itself. So you're looking for no chemicals. Can I read that? Do I understand what that is or not? Don't put anything in your mouth that you don't get. So we're looking at those things, but I also want to come back to looking at beans and legumes, great sources of plant-based protein, great sources of fiber. But for a lot of us, some of them don't agree with us and may not agree with you. So you've got to look and test those kinds of foods. Are they working for you? Other things are soy and eggs. We separate eggs from dairy. All of those things are inflammatory type foods. Now, you and I know this one, sugar. It is artificial sugars equally as bad. The only things you can really count on, stevia and monk fruit as being better, but we don't necessarily want to train our taste buds to love sweet anyway. So you want to be a little careful about how much of any artificial sweetener that you're taking in. So healthy foods. We've also learned at one point fruits and vegetables, right? This was one group. And unfortunately, a lot of us, loved the fruit way more than we love the vegetables. And even natural sugars in fruit can increase the blood sugar levels that happen with a meal and definitely that happen with a snack where I always say, don't eat fruit naked. And what I mean is not you necessarily, but what that either, really probably not a good idea. But what I mean is the fruit all by itself will tend to make your blood sugar rise faster than if you have this fruit, say at the end of a meal as your dessert, or you have this fruit with coconut cream, which is very decadent, by the way. One of my passions, uh, or you have fruit with uh, a little nut butter or seeds and nuts so that you're offsetting the sugar impact 
and the absorption because the protein and the fat take longer to digest. And I realize that eating an apple you've been taught versus applesauce is better because it's got the skin on it. However, there's still degrees of how much can we afford right now in midlife for our blood sugar and insulin to spike because when we have blood sugar go up, insulin should and does come in to damper that. But the problem is insulin stays high and when it stays elevated, insulin does this. Stop, it says, stop fat burning and store fat. So it's got two messages, neither one of them are good, right? So we want to have a lower spike in blood sugar and a lower spike in insulin levels from our meals. And that takes looking at, but we also want to make sure we're absorbing the foods that we do eat. And if you're eating foods that cause inflammation for your body, that actually upset your gut lining, which can happen with any of those things like gluten and wheat and eggs and dairy and soy and sugar and even peanut products, then you may not be actually taking in as much healthy food as you think or absorbing the goodness from it. So what can you do about it? Becoming aware, first of all, just of that. And, and I'm not trying to convince you that any one diet is a one size fits all because it's not or that you should never eat those foods again. But there's a way to eat them kind of in a rotational basis if they don't bother you. And what you wanna do is test what's working for me right now. And you wanna take that information and decide, is this something I need to look at? Is this a problem? I mean, what would be causing me to have a struggle absorbing these nutrients and these kinds of foods and digesting them? So you can get to the underlying root cause, not just take foods out that we need some of those micronutrients, right? We don't want to just take them out and ignore the fact, I need some of the things that are in those, We've got to figure out why can't I and how can I improve that or how do I otherwise get those micronutrients in my diet because you, my friend, need to function like a car. You got to be working on all with all the parts, all cylinders firing to have a good healthy metabolism. So track your food intake for a day even, but if you'll do it for three days or do it for a full week, you can use an app if you want to. Don't pay so much attention to calories. Sure, look at it, but what you really want is, as you write all that down, you can either Google and look things up. You wanna pay attention to how much protein are you taking in? How much fat? How much of your diet is carbohydrates? How many servings of vegetables, not just fruits, but vegetables are you getting? The non-starchy kind, not those carbohydrates, but the non-starchy kinds. Like asparagus and broccoli and cauliflower and carrots and greens and mushrooms and onions, all of those that contribute to great gut health, great health all over, those you want to take a good look at. And how much sugar is sneaking in there? How much? How many chemicals? How much throughout the day are you actually trying to slip in a little sugar? Because maybe you're relying on it, something artificial for energy more than you really realize that's a huge energy and weight loss block. We can't artificially get to a real change easily. Make sense? We can't artificially get to a real and permanent change easily. All right, I'm going to see you on the flip side and I'm going to be back with block number three to your best energy and your optimal weight.